carbon, and then what makes a, a legitimate offset, and then what's going on with uh, international deforestation, red, red plus. So, to start, I have a huge apology to make from last time. Um, <laughs> I was horrified when I found it. The lessons learned are check your work and look at what you've written down. Does it even make sense? <laughs> Nobody called me on it, but I said, California made trillions of dollars on our, on our auction revenue. Now, wait a minute. Does that really make sense? No. So that was obviously um, an error. So please uh, change your notes. <laughs> Uh, billions is still a lot of money, but um, anyway, I'm very sorry about that, but we're, we're, we're all fallible, so I'm sorry about that. So I'd like to start with some current events, just so that we remember that all this is, is real stuff. Um, the Marshall Islands are a very low line. They're one of four of the lowest line atolls in the South Pacific. And they have now officially declared a climate crisis. Their, their government body is now calling on the international community to please give us finance. We are, it, our days are numbered. Um, uh, climate change is a freight train that's heading straight <coughs> towards the marshals. No country has greater cause to declare a climate crisis. This is today's New York Times. Today's New York Times was really interesting. There were all kinds of, I was reading a lot of it. So here's a whole, a whole uh, page and a half. From the rooftops, retailers embrace solar power. This is a Target store, and they're installing their 500th rooftop, solar rooftop array on stores across the country. And Walmart is doing the same thing, and they have international uh, distribution centers also. They're competing over who can be greener. And they're doing it, as they say, because their customers demand it. They did a survey. Their customers are concerned about sustainability. And plus, what's the real reason? I mean, this is a good reason. This is a good reason why they're doing it. What's the real reason? Money, money, money. Cheap. Yeah, it's really saving money for them. Uh, and once they make the calculations, they figure out, hey, we have these huge distribution centers, all this space that are putting in solar. So here's their distribution center in Phoenix, and when you fly in, in the plane, you look down at the Target logo made out of solar panels. Mm -hmm. oh, very clever. Um, then, this, this is a big deal. Um, a full page ad in the business section, this means it was paid for, uh, an open letter to the CEOs of corporate America. It's time to lead on climate policy. So there's a whole bunch of signat uh, signatures on it. You know who Sally Jewell is? Uh, Obama administration, she was the uh, cabinet secretary for the Department of the Interior and was very much a, an environmental strong, strong advocate. Fred Krupp, the president of the Environmental Defense. So these are all the top U.S. major environmental uh, uh, organizations are calling upon CEOs to lead on climate policy. In addition to all the good voluntary stuff you're doing, strong public policy is essential. So they're calling on CEOs need to unleash the most powerful tool they have to fight climate change, their political influence. So here's major environmental organizations asking the business top CEOs, use your corporate power, your political power in Washington to, to get going. Of course, in this last week, we had the big typhoon in Japan. Uh, now, as you know, we can't say that this typhoon was caused by climate change, but it fits the pattern of the extreme to become more extreme. This was a very uh, devastating typhoon. Uh, it's the biggest, strongest storm in more than six decades. It flooded uh, huge areas. Their bullet train was flooded. The stations, uh, are, do you know the Shinkansen bullet train? It's very 
famous for being a very fast transit system that they use their national railway. And it, it's gurgling. Um, extreme weather could become a regular issue for mass transit systems like the National Railway, and it's really expensive. So this, this has, uh, I mean, this is just a mess. It's really sad to see the kind of, of damage and destruction and hardship on people's lives. These are, this is a family that's in one of the evacuation centers. We've all seen pictures like this. But again, real people are being affected by, by this. Okay, so now we'll move on. Um, so obviously, climate change is a global problem, and it needs an international solution. So we're going to talk about what is the UNFCCC leading up to Paris, and then moving on from there. So some basic terminology. UNFCCC stands for the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change. A COP is the conference of the parties. Uh, parties are countries. There are, depending on how you count them, <laughs> sometimes you see 193, 195, 196, but basically there's around 193 official countries in the UN, plus two Palestine, the UN recognizes Palestine and the Vatican as a UN member. So parties send delegates, official um, uh, delegates, to the COPs, and they are the official negotiators. They're the ones who go behind the closed doors after about day three, and observers uh, do not have access to them except uh, uh, in special meetings. But the UN has a very strong commitment to civil society participation, which is, which is everybody, and so they have created uh, NGO, you know NGO, non-governmental organization, constituencies, Ingos, bingos, ringos, tungos, youngos. Okay, what are those? What's an ingo? That was the first one. An environmental NGO. Bingo is the business and industry, I guess, NGO. Ringo is the one that I caucus with. Those are the research organizations. Um, so this is where all the universities are. And a lot of faculty around the country get uh, observer credentials and they bring cadres of students um, to the COPs. Uh, they're two-week-long two sessions, so students often come and they go for like the first week and then they swap their credential. There's only so many. Swap your credential for another student for the second week. Um, so, and then there's hundreds of other uh, approved, you have to go through a process, NGOs, and this is where I get Oh, there's a line that's missing here. The, the other independent NGOs, and that's where I get my credential is um, from an organization I'm affiliated with. So the UNFCCC is just one of many UN conventions. Uh, you've heard of some of them, um, but the Convention on Biological Diversity, International Civil Aviation, this is getting big in the forestry realm now, uh, ozone, combat desertification, you can find lots of these kinds of instruments uh, that the UN uh, adopts. Um, so every cop has a logo. This happens to be my little personal collection of logos of the ones that I've been to. I haven't, this is Santiago, so that's coming up this December, I have, have been there. But anyway, I've, I've uh, had the privilege of going to a lot of these and really watching this process evolve. So when you walk into a COP, um, the biggest impression, and this is, this is from Bali, my first one back in 2007. Holy cow, look at the number of people who are here who know about climate. In the US, nobody's talking about climate. Um, but these rooms are jammed. Uh, and every, so every country is represented here, and they, here's uh, Copenhagen and uh, COP50. And um, so, the parties often have many delegates in their, in their, with the official badges, so you get a lot of people into these things. Here's Poland um, in 2008. So they know a lot about climate change, and they've been at it a long time, and they pass it on through their, through their job and their, their bureaucracy and so on. 
So there's a serious, a progression of policy um, actions and progress over the last 26 years since um, the UNFCCC was first uh, developed in 1992. And the ones with the stars are ones that I'm going to just say something about here, but there's other ones in between on this timeline. So here's a list of where all the cops have been over time. But let's go back to 1988, because this is where it first, uh, this, this is one of the early starts. 1988, the World Meteorological Organization, which is a UN body, and the UNEP, the UN Environmental Program, realized that climate change was occurring, there was scientific data starting to accumulate, and they merged and formed the IP, or they created the IPCC, which you have read some of the reports from. So the IPCC is an independent body that reports to the 195 UN governments and they don't conduct their own research, but they are hundreds of scientists who review all the thousands of papers during the year or during the last period of time, and they provide the summary of the drivers of climate change impacts and how you can reduce risks. They present their information through assessment reports. So the first IPCC report came out in 1990, and that's what led, that was the database the, the report, the action uh, causing um, report that led to the creation of the, of the convention. There's a second report that led up to the Kyoto Protocol three years later. Then there have been a couple more here on um, more, more, more data and so on. A new one will be coming out in, in 2022 in time for what's called the first global stock take. How have we been doing since um, since Paris in, in particular? And then there have been a whole series of special reports, and Michael has uh, shown you some of these. Does this go down anymore? There's not that. There's a switch um, to the button. Okay. Um, anyway, Michael has alerted you to some of these uh, special reports. This one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a down, down switch there. There we go. Oh, okay. <laughs> Let's try that. So this first IPCC report came out around um, uh, 89, and they made the definitive statement, we are certain that emissions resulting from human activities are substantially increasing GHGs, resulting in additional warming. So way back then, they are making a declarative statement that this is happening. So this led then to the first Earth Summit. This was called the Rio Earth Set, Rio de Janeiro, was held in Rio. And here they are, these are the delegates, these are the heads of state, and George Bush Sr., our president, went. Uh, these really are the heads of state. These are not just the State Department delegates. These are really the heads of state. And they showed up, and they were motivated. I'll show you what, what got, I mean, some more of the background on why they're there. But anyway, here they are. Um, and it was the largest environmental summit internationally at the time. And it had been um, stimulated by a 19, another report, a 1987 report called the Brundtland Report, Our Common Future. And this is where we first started talking internationally about this notion of sustainability, global sustainability. That they're putting out the alarm. You cannot develop without, um, I mean, we must have economic development that does not deplete natural resources and harm the environment. Now, this sounds very obvious to us today. Back, at the, back then, it was not. So this was, this Brooklyn report is still referred to as one of, the, one of the early documents. And it led to a whole conversation about sustainability have any of you in your classes talked about, about talked about the SDGs? This is good. I'm glad that some of you have because the United States has always kind of we don't talk much about the UN about the UN and all of its programs. 
we really don't know very much about them. If you're in Europe, if you're in the rest of the world, you are much closer to what the UN does and how the programs affect you. So we're kind of ignorant. Um, so these, the, the notion of these sustainable <coughs> development goals, there's 10 of them, and they're all good stuff. Uh, decent work and economic growth, peace, justice, and strong institutions, gender equality, good health and well-being, no poverty, that's number one, is to lift the world generally out of poverty. So there are whole metrics for measuring these in countries. We know very little about this, but this is a, a whole effort that's going on internationally, and it's a metric that you can uh, learn about and do more with. <coughs> but also out of the Brundtland Report is where they said, okay, we're going to have a global uh, Earth Summit, and we're going to respond to global environmental problems. And their biggest challenges, which are still the same as what we have today, how are you going to pay for it? How do we deal with rising levels of consumption? And the, here the developed nations are saying, well, we want the world to be sustainable. But the developing nations are saying, wait a minute, you've got yours, but don't tell us that we can't develop to the same standard that, that you uh, have. And so developing countries want to be given a chance to catch up socially and economically with the developed world. So therein lies the rub. So out of the Rio summit came five agreements. Those of you in biology know and wildlife know about the Convention on Biological Diversity and the Red List, the Cites Endangered Species List, um, got its uh, boost here, UNFCCC, there were principles of forest management. This continues on with the COFO and the Montreal indicators process, uh, and so on. So the, the so the, oops, sorry. So here we are. One of these instruments to come out of Rio was the UNFCCC, and it had a goal. And <laughs> I mean, we should. This is '92. We're saying this, and we're still fighting about it. That's what's so crazy. The goal is to stabilize greenhouse gases at a level to prevent dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate system and within a time frame that is sufficient to allow ecosystems to adapt naturally, ensure that food production is not threatened, and enable economic development to proceed in a sustainable manner. So way back then, we're saying these lofty goals for the, for, uh, for the uh, uh, convention. So we sort of already did this, didn't we? Yeah, that one, sorry about that. Okay, so, so the convention is adopted. Then you have a couple of years of organizational meetings with your uh, negotiators, and they come up with rules of order and that sort of thing. And you get to the third COP in Kyoto, and this is where they actually wanted to come out with an action-forcing document. So what they did was to divide the world into what they called Annex One and non-Annex One countries. Annex One were the developed countries, non-Annex One were the developing countries. The annexes are in an OECD uh, document, which is why they're called an annex. But in any event, mentally, we divided the world into two baskets, and the rationale was that the developed countries caused the problem, and so we should bear more of the burden for addressing it. And so the original tasks, the developed countries were required to report their emissions to the UN, and we still do that, and the US still does that. The EPA is our agency that reports US emissions to under the UNFCCC. And the Annex I countries were required to take a reduction target. At this time, uh, we were talking about 2012 as the goal date of five to seven percent. And the developing countries, however, had no obligations on them. They could do it voluntarily if they wanted, but they did not have to participate. So this distinction has a name, CBDRs, and you hear that, you hear that abbreviation, Common But Differentiated Responsibilities. Yes, we're all responsible for contributing to climate change, but we're differentiated 
and that developing countries don't have to take, don't have to do much. So the Kyoto Protocol came out of this COP um, in Japan, and it solidified this concept of CDRs, and it required the reporting and, and a target of emission reductions. It included the concept of carbon markets. Al Gore was at this, and he fought very hard to have this notion of carbon markets would be part of the conversation. And this is where the CDM, the Clean Development Mechanism, and the JI, these are um, credit trading schemes, the early, early phase that actually uh, got some legs to them. And then the notion of developed countries will help developing countries to make the transition in their economy, that was embedded in Kyoto also. So these fundamental concepts of targets, reporting, money, and, uh, and, and grants, and uh, so on, markets, uh, are embedded back here in 1997. Okay, who wants to answer that? Did the U.S. ratify the Kyoto Protocol? This is why. China and India were included in the basket of developing countries with no obligations. So the Senate, this was considered a treaty or protocol, it needed ratification by the Senate. We defeated it big time because China and India were not included and it would result in great harm to the U.S. economy because they were developing very quickly. They were emerging emission sources. And if they were to continue on the high carbon path, it would put a competitive disadvantage against everybody else, yeah. Why were, what got them in that category? Why weren't they in the developed? Because, you know, in many ways they are developing. They still have high rates of poverty and low income and things like that. But they also have, I mean, at least China has massive industry. You are exactly right, and that has that is the rub. Is that at the time? This is '97. This is you know 20 plus years ago. Um, uh, the the organization OEDC organization of what's EDC Economic Development something or others. It's a an, an international organization who categorized countries. They they were based on economic indicators, and they. They said these countries are still developed. These are developed. And they defined Europe and U.S. and Australia and New Zealand as developed. And Japan, and then um, and then the the group of developing. And according to that OECD, I'll I'll get the name for you. I should know it. Anyway, the OECD list had China and India in a still developing part of mode. And for that reason, because they were on that list in that document, they were put in. Now, there was probably conversation about it at the time, but um, nevertheless, that's where they were. They were considered a non annex one, and that set up the issue. So, um, that, just one second. So, just to finish the thought, this division is why it took so long to get to Paris and why Paris was such a big deal. Because this, this dynamic uh, <coughs> permeated the conversations for how many years? Uh, you know, 18 years, yeah. Were China and India going to be non-annex one countries permanently? Well, in theory, as, uh, I don't know where they are. We'd have to look at the developed at these lists now. Um, what the big thing about Paris was finally breaking down the CDDRs. That was the primary outcome of Paris, why it was so miraculous. And so when you go to a COP, you are reminded all the time that the US did not sign the Kyoto Protocol because everybody has a black name tag except the U.S. The non-signers have a white one. And um, uh, so here we are in France, and we, we, have a, we have a white name, you know, we're sort of this scarlet letter thing. 
<laughs> we didn't do it. <laughs> okay, so um, after Kyoto, there were these years of negotiations and stalemates. It was called the North-South Divide. It became polarized. The, quote, northern developed countries and the southern developing countries. And the rancor and the anger, when you're sitting in one of these plenaries and you're listening to floor speeches from some of the developing countries, there is true vitriol and, and anger at the developed, you caused it, oh, well, here we go. You caused it, you fix it, don't tell us how to develop, you pay us, we're the ones who are suffering, and your heart says, well, yeah. Um, and yet, here we have this dynamic. It was, we're not really worried about the emissions of half of the developing countries because they're so small. The, 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 we can afford to give them leeway, but China and India continue, they are now um, very strong economies and continue to get stronger and they continue to invest in coal because it's cheap. Um, and so who's gonna, who's gonna pay for this? So there was no trust by the South that the developed would meet their targets. We weren't, we were sort of blowing it off too. And there wasn't any money being of serious dimension being ponied up to help the developing countries mitigate and adapt and, or be, have, get the new uh, technologies without a bunch of barriers related to intellectual property constraints and the fear of technology being stolen and all that are all valid fears and they do continue to be part of the negotiations. How if companies want to invest in a developing country, great, we can cut a deal, we can find a solution, but we want to we don't want our technology stolen and you know what the story is there with going on today. So there's an interesting book if those of you who might be interested in this sort of thing. Uh, people analyze these conversations. So here's here's a book that's dealing with um, the rise and fall of climate negotiations from Copenhagen to Cancun, the turbulent start of the Copenhagen summit, and so on. So um, just so you know, there are uh, um, professional people who analyze this. It's their discipline, and so you can get into negotiations. So the countries tend to. Um, not 10, but they do negotiate by blocks. It's not that you have, you can have 195 people raising their hands and, and speaking, that does happen. Um, but typically, uh, countries take, affiliate uh, as a caucus with a block, and uh, come up with a unified position. So the EU, 28 members, they come out with a single unified position on all proposals. Um, now countries can join different, come out, they can be independent of their block, but by and large they stick with it. Um, but they're not concrete. So so I gave you a joke the other day about AOSIS countries, you think of small developing uh, island states that with Brexit, Britain might join this flock. Um, the umbrella group formed after Kyoto, sort of the developed uh, of big countries. The G77 plus China is the basic non-annex one countries, the developing countries. The African group caucuses together. There's a group of the least developed countries that caucuses. The ALBA countries are uh, Bolivia, Cuba, Venezuela, Nicaragua, these are countries that tend to take a position that is just diametrically opposed to anything that the developed countries want. They um, uh, use arguments regarding colonialism that we're now in, we're, this is just one more case of, of us imposing colonialist values and processes upon them. And so they have um, often been the holdout naysayer. Um, the environmental integrity group, Switzerland, South Korea, Monaco, Mexico, Liechtenstein. The Arab group, the oil countries, they hang together, definitely. And 
uh, in the daily schedule at these COPs, you can see, here they are. Uh, these are their caucus meetings for the Arab group and LDCs and so on. So, so it's, it's real. They meet, they meet together. So Kyoto um, is in force without the uh, U.S. countries. You, the EU is sort of abiding. Yeah. Um, what was up with the uh, gray blocks? Well, not everybody's in every, in, oh, I'm sorry. Uh, well, the Arab group is in here. That Mongolia, I don't know who they, they they're not affiliated. Um, uh, yeah, there's there's some holes in this map, but it's, uh, you know, but they but they show up and they make their voices heard okay. to, to the to the extent they want. What they're, group would they be put into? Like it looks like a lot of the stands. Well, they don't have to. They just don't meet in the morning at nine o'clock, or they find other country. They may informally join up with another negotiating block and just go to the room and be accepted into that group. Um, okay. You know, there's a lot of countries. Everybody, these, these, as I said, these are not concrete groups, but these are fundamental, basic negotiating groups that take positions. See, um, here's our small island developing states right here. So we're coming up to Copenhagen now in 2009, and the reason this was a landmark COP, a highly anticipated COP, was because Kyoto expires in 2012, and they wanted to get a run-on, a follow-on uh, agreement, and they, you have to agree on something, and then countries have to go back home and get it ratified, and come back so that by the time 2012 comes, you move on uh, smoothly. So you need some, uh, lead time to go through the process and the idea was to adopt a text so that countries can ratify it by 2012 and there was huge anticipation. I w this COP was um, in too small a venue. There were, uh, I don't know, 45,000 people that showed up for this and it was snowing and it was cold and it was dark and you're waiting in line to get in and a lot of people couldn't get in. and. Also, it wasn't just the State Department level uh, negotiators who came, all the heads of state were gonna come. This was a big deal. So there was huge anticipation. The task was seal the deal. And what they wanted, what, what the, now the, uh, the presidency of the COP varies every year. Countries host it, uh, continents are, the UN passes around the task of hosting these COPs each year, and they're so expensive and so big now, it's hard to find countries to <coughs> accept them. Uh, Brazil was supposed to do it this year, and they just said no. And so Santiago had to step up suddenly and, and uh, step in. But anyway, the Danes were in charge of this, and they their intention as good, good uh, um, Scandinavians, they had a very clear outline that, or outcome that they wanted. They wanted a new binding agreement um, with higher pledges from the, from the countries. They wanted money being put on the table. They wanted the uh, forestry tax adopted. And then there were a bunch of other things, uh, shipping, aviation, intellectual property. And all the heads of state were there. But by the second Friday, remember you've got two weeks, Monday um, through uh, Sunday they take off. So Monday through Saturday and then Monday through Saturday, and they're supposed to adjourn on Saturday. So by the second Friday, talks fail, summit in crisis. Here's uh, the head of China at the time, Wen Jibao, the Indian Prime Minister, Obama was there. He had just been elected. This was a big uh, platform moment for him. But the Annex I countries had a position that they did not want extension of the Kyoto Protocol. They wanted a whole new agreement with China and Brazil and India included. They wanted to get rid of the CBDRs. And they wanted, if it's their money that's gonna be put on the table to help developing countries develop, they wanted to have a role in how it is spent. The non-Annex One countries, though, they wanted to hang on to what they had. Uh, they wanted uh, the Annex Ones to take higher targets. They wanted lots of money. They didn't wanna be on the hook for high 
monitoring and verification standards, and they wanted to be in charge of how the money was spent. So this is a good spot to take a short, just a short break, stretch your legs and 